Oh, praise the Lord. So good. God is so good. Um, I guess I got a few announcements. Everything, well, nothing, nothing really. This week, um, we got service tonight at 6.30, and, um, and I'm not sure who's all coming to that yet, but we're, we've are we just been kind of working it out, and it's been awesome. We had so many services in the last week that we decided this week we're going to take a little bit of a break uh, coming up, uh, so there'll be no prayer this week, no daily prayer, and uh, no Wednesday night service. And do a little work in the house, our house, we're a little work in the church here this week too, so... Anyway, so this week is it's quiet, quiet. Yeah. chill time. <laughs> give, give, a, give a break and, and get ready for 2021 because I think we're going to be going into more services here and in, in the new year. Yeah, yeah just kind of send something's up and uh, to, to uh, get everybody in, in, in the, into services that want to be here. We're probably going to have to go ramp it up a little bit so anyway just something to pray about and um yeah so this week is quiet so i don't have to say a whole lot so but anyway i want to preach the word is that all right with you guys amen, amen. Yeah. okay so there's three or four that are ready <laughs> to hear the word of god today yeah, how about <laughs> how about how about you guys online you ready to hear the word of the lord thank you for joining us today on facebook and um, you guys are a little, little uh, lethargic today. As far as, how about we give the Lord one good clap offering and a shout? <laughs> maybe, 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 we, maybe we can wake ourselves up. But anyway, it's, it's just such a different season, different year, different Christmas, different everything. Um, but there's one thing that hasn't changed, and that's the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Jesus hasn't changed through any of this. It hasn't scared him, it hasn't shook him up, it hasn't surprised him, and he's about ready to unleash a counterattack against this plague, and I'm excited, and I can't wait, I can't wait to see what that all involves, uh, but it's going to take all hands on board. So, I want to talk today, give an after Christmas message, I guess. Um, like last week, I preached three Christmas messages, Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, and a little bit on Sunday. So we had five services in four days, and and uh, I've never done that before. To be honest, Christmas to me has always been a hard time to preach. I do not know why. It's just a mental block or some kind of weirdness in my mind. But this year we broke through. By the third, third night of Christmas services, I finally broke through and uh, had had a we had a good good time in the presence of the Lord. So t today I want to talk about worshiping the majestic one. And this is an after service type message. Is there a, kind of a ringing going yeah. on? It's kind of a ringing, dinging. But anyway, um, I want to go into an after Christmas type message. So let's pray. Let's pray together if you're here for the first time. And, and uh, I'd like you to pray, repeat this prayer after me. If you're on, online for the first time. Uh, ever watching, I want you to pray. And those that have you watched many times, I want you to pray. Uh, so let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, speak to my heart and change my life. In your precious name, amen. Amen. So, um, worshiping the majestic one, and the most majestic one is Jesus. Um, he is. Uh, I don't think there are really words to describe who he is. You know, lots, that's why I believe he gives us the praying in the spirit, because there's just times there's just not words to describe how good and how amazing Jesus is. And and it has been said that, and I agree with it too, that the Lord does nothing in the affairs of man except in answered prayer. So we're not praying, we're never asking, we're never believing, never really thinking anything's going to change. There's a good chance if you're like that, your life never will change. But prayer, praying, praying to God, praying for you know, His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven is like a really good place to start. 
How many would like His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? Amen. Amen. There's no sickness there. There's no plague there. There's no loneliness there. There's no disease. There's no media there. Um, <laughs> there's no Facebook there or any of that stuff um, that's so divisive on the earth. He, like everything in heaven is just run like is absolutely incredible. Like Jesse DePlante said, everything about heaven, it totally just, his mind almost exploded. He talked about how there was no shadow in, in heaven. He said, it really, like there's a shadow of me right here. He said he, he was, when he was in heaven, he had, he had, the Lord took him to heaven for a period of time. And how he, there was no shadow there. He's looking around and he's, <laughs> how does this work? And he said, the flowers and everything are so alive. He said, the flowers, when you walk by them, they, they, they turn as you walk by them. And they're looking at you. Everything, everything is just beautiful, incredible. Can't explain a lot of the stuff. He couldn't even explain a lot of the stuff that he had seen. But his will, his will is, is for, like his plan is for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And right now, when we look at stuff like that, we say, well, that, it doesn't look possible right now. Most churches aren't even open today. How are they going to, you know, and we should be meeting, right? Like we're going to meet somehow, one way or another, no matter what, because in Hebrews chapter 10, 25, it says that we're together. We're together. We're to, we're to meet. Don't, don't, don't forsake the assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. Don't do that. It's not a good thing to do. And he said, even more as the day of the Lord is approaching, you should be gathering together more. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm thinking we need to gather together more. Um, we only have three services a week. We only gather for prayer four days a week. Um, we're, we're only in the church doing something here six out of seven days. But the church could be used more. The gathering could be used more. And so it's a strengthening. But prayer, prayer came first before even the birth of Christ. Israel cried out for a Messiah for many, many generations to come and to rescue them and to vindicate them. And, and uh, they were praying for God to come and make Israel great again. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> make Israel great. Because Israel was a great nation at one time. But they, through disobedience and all, everything that they went through, uh, they got dispersed throughout the earth. But they were crying for the Messiah. They were crying. And God, God heard them. Here's the thing that you've got to understand about the, their prayer, though. They didn't get the Messiah they wanted. They got the Messiah they needed. They didn't understand that the Messiah that they, they needed was a Messiah that was coming for the whole planet, not just for them. They were, they were part of the equation. Israel still is the apple of his eye. Amen? Amen? Israel is a special nation, his own very nation. But he came not only to save them, out of their nation came a Redeemer. Out of their nation came the Messiah. But not just for them, for the whole world. And, and part of the plan for God is for bring, to bring all of Israel back into the fold. And so this is amazing. So this prayer, they, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And, and they cried out and they cried out and they cried out. Like we've been crying out for revival for many years, you know. And are we going to get the re revival that we want? Are we going to get the revival that we need? We're going to get the revival that we need. And it's going to be an awakening. And it's going to shake us all to the co core. It's not going to be singing and sitting around the campfire singing Kumbaya. It's going to, there's going to be, the Spirit of God is going to come in an aggressive way, I believe. And it's going to shake us out of our slumber. And we're all kind of a little bit in a slumber wondering what's going on right now. Because we can't quite, we can't figure out what God is, is, is doing right now. There's, there was that last year when Kansas City won the Super Bowl. For the first time in 50 years, uh, yeah. Bob Jones said, prophesied many, many years ago when Kansas City um, won the Super Bowl that there was going to be a great awakening begin to happen in, 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 uh, in the world. You know, and so the great awakening, it, it's like we look at it and go, 
oh man, all it was was like a pandemic, the church is shut down and everything else, but there's, stir, there's a stirring going on in the people's hearts right now for something. We're going to get, it's not going to, and before the pandemic came, there was like explosion of, of uh, a move of God all over the earth that was, that was coming and people, young people were gathering in stadiums and worship, the worship, the extravagant worship was incredible. There was people gathering and all of a sudden it was all shut down. And the enemy made a move that he's going to regret. I truly believe. Because that would have hit a limited amount of people. What God is bringing is going to hit an astronomical amount of people. And so in Matthew chapter 2, we find the story of the wise men that came from the east to worship Jesus. And uh, it's an incredible story. They, they weren't coming to worship him so that they could get something from him. Did you ever think about that? The, like the magi that come and there's different accounts. Uh, and we, if you go by our Christmas plays and stuff like that, there's three wise men came and had a couple of camels and a couple of little boxes of presents and stuff like that. But th that whole story, and I'm going to explain to you that that whole story, our whole perception of when the Magi come to see Jesus is probably a little bit out. So I'll explain that a little bit to you. But they were coming to worship him so that not so they could get something from him. They weren't coming to worship him so that he could be he, they could be healed or delivered from some demonic oppression or or they weren't coming for provision or any of that kind of stuff. He was a baby and they were coming to worship him for who he was. He was the promised Messiah but he was the promise who had yet to come into his fullness. Can you be kind of freak, freaked out if these magi showed up and two-year-old Jesus got up on his feet and started praying for him. Getting, <laughs> they're getting healed and delivered and set free. They were coming. They knew that they weren't going to get that. They were coming for them that showed that their heart was passionate for them. For him, and they understood that there, that there was a Messiah coming, and so there. This is a form of pure worship, worshiping God for and not expecting anything from Him in return. Wow, that's maybe where our heart needs to get to. Maybe that's what we need to get to as a as a people, as a body. Let's look at Matthew chapter 2. And it's always a good idea when reading scripture, you read it carefully. Don't be into speed dreaming. Speed dreaming. Because there's things that I miss and watch and read it over and over and then 10 years later. Oh, I didn't see that before. You ever have that happen? It happens quite a bit. It says, verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men uh, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Key statement right there. They were, tro they was tr they were troubled, like, what is this all about? And this is, this is probably two years, it's two years after the birth of Jesus. And when he gathered all the chief priests and the scribes and all the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem, in Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And when Herod... Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had, sent, had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. 
Verse 11. When they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary and his mother fell down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they then being divinely warned in the dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So I'm about to shake up some theology here. And not necessarily theology, our thoughts and beliefs, how this all took place. Now Jesus at this time was about two years. These guys were on a, like a two-year journey. They heard of the birth of Jesus and it took them two years to get there. And notice this too, that he wasn't, this isn't in a stable, this portion of scripture, this isn't in a stable, it, as portrayed in most plays about the nativity. It says right there, they had come into the house. Did you see that? Verse 11, when they had come into the house, they saw the young man, our young child, and with Mary and his, and his mother, and he fell down. These guys too, uh, the, the Magi, probably weren't three, three people. There were some historians say that it could have been between 12 to 30, even 60 people. 60 Magi that come. And with each Magi, say if there was 30, and each Magi they, they thought had an entourage of 70 people with them. So if there was 30, it was 2,100 people came to town. Did, does that maybe give you an understanding of why all Jerusalem was in an uproar? Like, can you imagine if 2,100 people arrived on camels into Saskatoon one day? Do you think that would create somewhat of an uproar? Or even 2,100 vehicles. And they went to the, the find somebody. They, they were looking for some. 21. They were, they, this is an uproar. And so... Um, and re now this is another mystery of this story. Two, remember that now this was announced in the sh to the shepherds two years earlier. The, remember that? The, the angels come and they, they, and they told everybody, the angels come and announce the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, a town of about 300 people. They told every single person they saw about what the angels told Jesus. And by this time, nobody in all of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is six miles away from Bethlehem, nobody knew anything about a baby Messiah. <laughs> they forgot. They, nobody knew. They couldn't find. They couldn't give directions. They couldn't. They couldn't do any. They couldn't figure out where could this child. And th these guys, you know, you think after the shepherds announced this to everybody in Bethlehem and everybody they seen, but everybody all of a sudden forgot. It's kind of like revival. That happens sometimes when revival hits a community. Everybody's madly in love with Jesus, and then five, six years later, it's all forgotten. Um, the, the revival in Wales, one of the greatest moves of God ever in the history of the earth, where 100,000 people were swept into the kingdom in six months. Five years after that revival, there was no sign of revival in the whole land. Zero. They all forgot. So it happened back here too. It happened. So, so remember Luke chapter 2 verse 16 18? It says, They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they, were, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all those heard it marveled at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. So why when would Herod and all of Jerusalem be troubled? It, it almost appears like the, the, this amazing news was forgotten about or died down or was hidden from Herod till this time in history for whatever reason. Like I say, that ha it happens. I've seen people touched mightily by God. Major move, you know, God speak to them, touch them, change their lives, and you see them a year or two down the road, and everything's forgotten. What happened? What is it? Is it maybe something that 
we're missing along the way. And so the wise men were asking for directions and nobody seemed to know where Jesus was. Hmm. Nobody in the community, nobody. Nobody had any idea that he was there. And so, but if nobody will help you, the Lord will help you himself. Amen. There's no, there's never, there's never saying, oh, I was left alone. When you're alone, you cry out to God. And these people would not give up. Matthew chapter 2, verse 3 to 7, it says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he gathered the chief priests, the scribes, and the people, he inquired where the Christ was born. So they go through that whole thing again. And, um, and then finally, they, the wise men caught on. There was a stream given. They, the Magi were caught and said, no, no, don't, don't go that. Don't go back there. He's not a good one. So on one hand, you had a group of men who wanted to lavishly worship the king of the Jews. And on the other hand, you had a king who wanted to violently kill the king of the Jews. It's pretty, there's kind of this thing that goes on. You either usually either love Jesus or hate him or you're indifferent. There's three different things that can happen. And so this is what Matthew chapter 2 verse 10 says. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. These magi were like, they wanted to come and worship the king. No strings attached. They're going to worship him, give lavish gifts, and then and on, their, on the road they were. And exceedingly, it says exceedingly great joy. Exceedingly means two basic meanings for this word. Excessively and violently. They rejoiced against all the powers of darkness. Great joy is, I said this on, on the last week, that great joy is making a scene because you're happier than you deserve. Amen? Mm -hmm. When you think, when you see a person who's excessive in church sometimes, excessive in joy, excessive in worship, we, we sometimes think, oh, that's just fake, he's just showing off, or she's just showing off, or... That kind of stuff like that. That that does that, that. That people do think it. I mean, I remember when I first got saved, I used to think it. Like, what's wrong with these people? You know, to be honest with you. But they had something that I knew nothing about. And so, um, this is not, it, this excessiveness is not fake or made up. And we sometimes get irritated. Unless it's a sporting event, of course. It's... <laughs> It, it's okay to worship our favorite athletes um, with excessive <laughs> worship, excessive jubilation. And there's all right. I've, I've been one of those crazy people too in my, in my past. But there's nothing wrong with being excessive towards the Lord. It's something that should be, as a matter of fact, it should be just, it's, it should be a part of our DNA. And it's, we're Canadian and we're working our way out of that, that silliness, you know. Some of you are fortunate enough not to have been born in Canada. And if excessive for you in, from different cultures is, is really acceptable. In Canada, it's not. Like, unless, again, it's a sporting event. I remember in the, in the Winter Olympics, Canadians are known as like, very quiet. Right? But in the, win, the last time the Winter Olympics were in Canada, that all went out the tubes, or down the tubes, just gone. Because they were so loud at curling games, that they had to, they had to stop the stop the game and stop the people from cheering <laughs> in Canada. So that's breaking off. If we can become that like way in sports. We can become that way in church. Amen. 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 And so Matthew two one two uh, two eleven again. It says when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts. To him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Mir. So these guys, they didn't travel to two years and just bring some gold dust. You know? And, and that's why some say there were so many people with them. The, the entourage with them was like an army to protect them from bandits on the road 
as they were traveling because you know it, it, it was worse back then than it is now as far as security out in the country. There was no safety whatsoever. And, and so they, they brought these gifts and you can imagine what these gifts were like. Some people, and I, I believe it too, but some people, some historians believe that it funded uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus' next few years in, in Egypt. It survived, they brought so many gifts, they lavished so many gifts upon them, but their, their, their gifts were just an expression of their worship. Um, verse 13 and 15 says, and now when they had departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Arise, and, arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring word to you. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. So extravagant worship will protect the move of God. That moment, that extravagant worship came and it was, it was brought before Jesus. And it, it set up a, a protective, um, a security force around Jesus. It protected the move of God. It protected him. And extravagant worship will protect your relationship with God too. If you are a worshiper, a true worshiper, the chances of backsliding become very slim. Very slim because you're in the in worship, really worship. In, when we're worshiping as a people and we're, we're worshiping as an individual, the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits the worship of his people. He enthrones, he sets his throne up on that worship. And so that worship that they brought that day to that house, it set something up so that they could move on and go to the, get to the next realm and move on and protect from that wicked King Herod. Herod was wicked. He went out and he killed uh, an unbelievable amount of babies, two years and under, because they were they were trying to figure out who these babies. They didn't. He didn't want to take any chance. He wanted all these male babies dead. He was a butcher. He was an evil man. He, he, all he wanted was power, and he could care less about anything else. That Messiah that was in that town in those days, it, it it's unexplainable how you could even want to become like that. Power hungry, do you, do you ever see power hungry people? They'll do anything they can to get power, no matter what, lie, cheat, manipulate, steal, do whatever they have to do. But extravagant worship will protect the move of God. Bill Johnson says that it's tragic when people worship God with closed hands. And, it, and no man can ever make history, no matter what, no man can make history without sacrifice. And that sacrifice that we bring worship, worship is a form for, for us, thank God, it's a sacrifice. <laughs> I thank God we don't have to bring animals anymore. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Using words or phrases that are only used to magnify God. Get to that place where we, we become a people who magnify God. We, we become a people who are known as people who love God, worship Him. We're in the process of becoming that people. I know some people, they, they, won't, they won't worship God unless they have their proper guitar. Like Justin, I know Justin would, Justin has a guitar over, there's a guitar over there and there's a guitar here, but he always will use this one because that's the, the one that he feels brings the best sound to God. It costs something to a guitar. It wasn't free and it wasn't cheap. <laughs> so it's like, it's like worshiping extravagantly should cost you something. Amen? 
when people arise, um, when a people arise that are excessive worshippers, the enemy will use all resources to put an end to it. David, King David, was an excessive worshiper. Excessive. He set up the tab in the tabernacle. He he set up worship twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, three hundred and sixty five days of the year for over thirty years. Some say thirty two years. Worship. Could it be that's why he never lost the war? <laughs> when he was at the helm, their their victory victory was common because he was an excessive worshiper. Excessive worship, worshipers enter into a realm where the Lord is enthroned. It, in that realm, there is fullness of joy. This is where God is, God is enthroned. There's a fullness of joy. It's excessive. It's incredible. It's amazing. Um, impossibility does not exist in that realm of excessive worship. God will show you things when you're worshiping that you will don't even think are possible to be accomplished. But impossibility doesn't exist in that realm. In that realm of excessive worship, love conquers all. In all of us. And that's a process. That's why it's so important to be, be worshiping the Lord as much as possible. All the time. Um, in that realm of excessive worship, there's no pain or sorrow. It's, it's a funny thing. Like That is... I've experienced that so much in services. Like in mo for most part, I never feel any kind of pain, any kind of distraction, any kind, anything in services. And then when I go out a couple hours later, I start to feel stuff again. What could that be? Maybe my attitude of the heart is proper in here, and as soon as I walk out that door, maybe my attitude of my heart isn't quite so proper. Anybody relate to that? In that realm, no sorrow, no pain. In the, in the enemy is powerless in that realm of excessive worship. When we come and worship the majestic one and we come into a place, there's no, there's no room for him to get in there if our hearts are set on worship. I remember one Sunday night we worshiped for over three hours straight, never preached, nothing. And it was just, there was just, we, we got to a place where we looked at each other. We actually loved one another, no matter what our, we all have quirks and quirks about us that are a little unique. A little, we're all, let's put it this way, we're all a little strange. <laughs> at times, we, we are. There's, there's no question about it. You know, I, I know you hang out with me long enough, you will find out that I am one strange cookie. <laughs> it's just the way God built but in, in a sense <clears throat> that can create division because if you don't agree with me on one thing or another you know, I don't, you know, I just don't, whatever you know, it, it creates that it creates uh, friction within the body of Christ but when we get into that atmosphere of worship where we're worshiping God nobody's looking at each other no more like that you can't just sit there and worship for three hours and by yourself in the flesh. It's just not going to work. Is that everybody gets tired. Everybody wants to go home after 15 minutes. I remember when I first got saved, going to church in an hour was torture at times. You know why it was torture? Because I had no idea about worship. I had no idea why people were lifting their hands. I had no idea why people were singing these songs. To me, it just didn't make any sense. Why are they singing? What, what's this all about? What's it, is, this is really meaningless. Why, what, what's with that lifting their hands? You know, we question people lifting their hands in church services, but we don't question people lifting their hands in a rock concert. Uh -huh. <laughs> Guess what? We lifted our hands, and believers lifted their hands long before the world did. You read it in the Psalms. There was no rock and roll when King David was around. <laughs> Did you know that? You know, there was no rock and roll. Uh, rock and roll never come to the 50s <laughs> when Elvis came along. And so then the hands, they copied us. <laughs> when it comes right down to it. 
but you get into that atmosphere of worship. That's, I remember going to Pensacola for the first time when we went to revival. First time we ever experienced revival. First time we ever experienced like just totally getting lost in the presence of God. Totally. They had no overhead projector there. And worship would go most of the time two to three hours long. Every night. Night after night after night. And then the message would be preached. Well, there'd be testimonies. The message would be preached. And then they'd pray for people for two or three hours and worship would go on. Worship would continue. People lost in the presence of God. Like dignified people. Dignified women under the pews. Flat out, like totally in, immersed in the presence of God. Extreme worship. Night after night after night after night. How does that happen? There's absolutely no religion there. People outside, you go walk out of the church at 1 o'clock in the morning after the service, and there's people laying on the ground outside because they're hit with the power and the presence of God. It's, it was all set up by that worship, the majestic worship, worship worshiping the majestic one. Presence of God pouring down on a people. When you when the presence of God shows up, it, you don't notice the weakness of others. You don't notice the weirdness of others. You don't know. You don't. You don't. You look at somebody in a different light as a creation of God. And and we get out of it. As human beings, everybody's guilty of it. Nobody, nobody can say that I'm perfect with everybody all the time. I never get impatient. I never get ticked off. As soon as we pull ourselves out of the realm or out of the attitude of worship, worshiping the Lord, then Lord, then the flesh starts to rise up. And believe me, I know it. I know what my flesh is like, and it works that way. And so, as smart, uh, get, what's this? As smart as the devil was, you know, and he, he's pretty tricky. He's fooled every one of us one or two times in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. But he couldn't find Jesus. He couldn't find baby Jesus. He couldn't enter into that realm because he wasn't capable of worship because of his pride. Yeah. He could not enter into that realm to where Jesus was. He couldn't even get close to it because he refused to worship. He had pride. He said, I'm not bowing down to God ever. That was the attitude of his heart. He, and God made sure that his presence was never available for him to get into. So he, right there, at that moment, he couldn't get to Jesus. There's a saying that goes, wise men still seek him. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. We get ourselves in trouble when we don't seek the Lord. We get ourselves in trouble when we start seeking other things other than God. And when you seek the Lord, there's a multitude of blessings that come along with it. Financially, spiritually, physically, mentally, every area of your life. When you seek the Lord, even your mental capacity changes. Amen. It does. There's people that become brilliant after they get connected with God, but before we're not so brilliant. <laughs> It's not the brilliance was always there, but it something when you get into the presence of God, when you start worshiping, getting that art of worship, it, it begins to unleash something within you that has already been there, but it was locked up because of pride and, and all kinds of stuff like that. It says, so, back to verse 13 and 16. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in the dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee. So they did that. And they departed to Egypt. And Herod, what did he do? Verse 16 says, when Herod, when he saw he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And went crazy with anger. That's, that's what he meant. It meant he went crazy with anger. And he sent forth, sent forth and put death 
put to death all male children who were in Bethlehem and in all of its districts from two and older, or two, two years and under, sorry, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. The wise men used this as an opportunity to bring pure worship to the king. And this pure worship was protected also. It all financed the work of the Lord for the next two years. King Herod used it to bring destruction to a, a whole lot of innocent babies because he, because he refused to acknowledge the true king had arrived. His action is reserved for judgment and it's not good. To refuse to worship the king of kings opens the atmosphere to be overrun with demonic activity that leads to destruction. I'm going to, I'm going to read that one more time. To refuse to worship the king of kings opens the atmosphere to be overrun with demonic activity that leads to destruction. Yeah. Worshiping the Lord with excessive worship restores honor to his great name. It opens up the door for the king of majesty uh, to come in and to invade and to change the atmosphere of entire communities. And actually therein lies the opportunity to change nations. Excessive worship handcuffs the enemy and neutralizes demonic activity. Um, is it Second Chronicles 20? It talks about Jehoshaphat. How, how the worship team went before the army. The worship, it was excessive worship. It went before the army and it, it paralyzed and neutralized the effects of evil. They turned on one and sent the enemy into confusion. Worship will send the enemy into confusion. They turn, they turn on one another. They turn on. Watch this year. The enemies of God start turning on one another. Watch it. You can, you can watch that on the news, but don't watch anything else. <laughs> Just kidding. You do what you want to do. People say, oh, he's, he's got a cult. He's telling people not to what to do. What you want. Well, watch that. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be an interesting time because the move of God is about to attend, intensify upon the planet, and I want to be a part of it. Justin and Elisha, come down. Come on down. Bless the Lord. So here we are. It's an amazing story, you know, when we look at it from the perspective of not the Sunday school play, of really what happened when it's two years later, nobody, everybody forgot Jesus was born from the time he was born till two years later. Everybody. It's, it's quite fascinating. But the Magi, they knew about it, and they traveled for two years. How would you like that? That tells you that they had a heart that was... Be, it, there's nobody in history that could compare to that up until that time. I don't think. They traveled for two full years. How about we just got up and just left and just started traveling till we found a move of God somewhere. Like, really, we don't have to do that because it's going to is here. God is here. But in those days, there was no Messiah to turn to. <laughs> it was days of evil. Those days were wicked. And they say at the time, at the time that Jesus was on earth was the worst, one of the most evil times in history of the world. We think that everything's got to be together on the world before God can move. No, God can move. He wants a remnant of people that, he, that will believe in him. A remnant of people who want him. A remnant of people who want them in their lives. And it can change the, the whole world, the whole society. It can change. God always works through a remnant of people. Always. He doesn't need the majority he doesn't need. He doesn't need. Uh, he doesn't need the the um, what do you call it? He doesn't need the permission from political parties to move. <laughs> he, he doesn't. He doesn't. 
He doesn't, he doesn't need the laws to be right in order for him to move. People say, oh, we gotta, you know, we got to obey the government and all that. We do up to a point. Let me ask you this. In, in China, do you think the church needs to obey the laws of the government? Because it's totally illegal to meet there. Totally. Totally against God. It's, they're totally against God. Totally. They're violent enemies towards God. And they butcher people. They, they kill Christians. They put them in jail. They put them in gulags. We have a prime minister in Canada said that he admires the Chinese dictatorship. Does he admire the fact that they put innocent people in jails and butcher them? And uh, it's not only Christians, it's Muslims and any religion. They go, to, they go to prison camps there. I can't admire something like that. There's, it's not possible for me to admire something like that. I admire the Christians though in China because nothing stops them. I always hear there's a hundred million people there in the church in China. I, I, I've heard from people that have been there that it's more like 200 million. And they can't be stopped. Excessive worship. They praise the Lord. For they, they do, they, they pray for their, their government and stuff that, that they would come to know Jesus and all that kind of stuff. Their hearts are different than everybody else because they're excessive worshipers and they pray continuously. In China, if you don't go to prayer at 4 o'clock in the morning, every day you're considered a fallen angel. <laughs> Why do they pray like that? Because they, they have to. They have to stay, they have to have their hearts to stay right. Because if you've got a government oppressing you, you can lose that ability for your heart to stay right. They have to worship every day. They have to be in the Word of God every day because they can become angry, bitter, and totally evil people just the same as anybody else can become. But they, they want to, they're, the, they're into excessive worship. They're into worshiping the majestic one because they love him and, and they don't worship him so that, you know, they don't worship him so that they can miss the tribulation. I wonder if you ask the church, the church in China, do you think you have to live through the tribulation? They go, absolutely, we've been living in it ever since the last 70 years or whatever, however long the communists came. I'm not saying that that's part of my theology or whatever, I'm just thinking, if things go sideways, does that mean we stop worshiping God? If somebody gets mad at us, do we stop worshiping God? Or do we worship Him all the more? When things get rough, when things get tough, do we, should we stay home from church because we might get arrested? No, I think we worship Him more. If we go to jail, then we find other people that can worship with us. <laughs> hey? <laughs> yeah, like Paul, yeah, absolutely. I love that. That's a great example. Paul and Silas, they're in the inner cell. And the inner cells were probably the grossest. Because there was cells on top of them and stuff dripped down on urine and feces and stuff dripped down on them and they're whipped and they're beaten. They're, whipped, they're, they're just, they've been re beaten with rods and whips. So they're open and they're laying and, and they're in shackles. And, stalks on their feet what do they do but get up and start worshiping god they worship they, they, they start singing this is the day that the lord has made <laughs> we will rejoice and be glad in it and, and they, they, it impressed god so much in the midst of their trial in the midst of their tribulation that he god started tapping his feet started an earthquake an earthquake happened and all the chains and all the shackles fell off all the prisoners all around what about if our excessive worship if we become a worship people of, of excessive worship that the chains and shackles of drug addicts on the streets or 
wherever. It's not only on the streets, but it's in every house. There's a drug addict. There's in every type of people. There's people who are struggling with, with uh, no matter rich or poor. I was listening to Mike Lindell the other day, uh, the, the founder of My Pillow. 2009, he was a crack cocaine addict. Highly functioning addict. You know, we think of just addicts on the streets. This is a highly functioning addict. He's on the streets. Or the, he's not on the streets. He's living in nice houses. He's got his around rich people. And he's a highly functioning coke addict. And he was, he was so heavy into drugs, he stayed up for 14 days doing his work. And he stayed 14 days, 14 nights, and his drug dealers told him, he says, listen, we're not giving you any more drugs. We're cutting you off because you're, you're going to be dead pretty soon. And here's what his drug dealers, listen to this. It, this is crazy. We, we think people have to be all right. God spoke to him about this thing with his pillow when he was like, in 2002, he was a drug addict messed up person. God gave him a dream and a vision. Give him a platform so that he could reach the world and he could reach other drug addicts like him through his dream. And now he's messed up for another 2002, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Finally, he's going to die from doing these drugs and his dealers told him, he said, listen, Remember you said that God gave you a dream for this pillow and it's going to be a platform where you can help other drug addicts? He says, no, you, we're not giving you any more drugs because we want you to come back and help us. Crazy. Then he doesn't get born again until 2017. <laughs> Check this out. Like it's God's timeline. You don't know what God is doing in a person's heart. Amen? But our excessive worship, let, let me find a scripture for you. I just want to do this. Um, I'm sorry, I got, I got all revved up here all of a sudden. Um, I'm, trying, I'm, trying, I'm trying, to, trying to help you. I'm trying to help us break out of our slumbers, our sleeps. And this, in Acts chapter 15, this changed my life when I began to understand worship. Um, Acts chapter 15, this is a, um, a fulfilled promise, I believe it is from Amos. It's just, but whatever, I'll, I'll find out later. But it says, Acts chapter 15, verse 16, it says, After this, I will return and I will build the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will rebuild these rooms and I will set it up. And the tabernacle of David I talked about was excessive worship. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. So God's going to set this tabernacle again in the, in, in the last days. Why is he doing this? Why is he setting up this tabernacle again where there's excessive worship 24 hours a day, 7 days a week? So that we in the church can feel good about ourselves and we can connect with God. But it doesn't say that. In the next verse, it says, he said, he actually says, I'm going to set it up. He says, this is why I want you to become excessive worshipers so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who have called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Hello? So, he can, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. That's what worship does. It creates an atmosphere that goes outside the walls of a building. It comes out, comes outside of you, from inside of you, it creates an atmosphere where people can actually begin to seek the Lord. Wow, that's what happened to, to me anyway. Many years ago when I got into an atmosphere, that atmosphere was like, finally it unlocked something in my brain where I could go after God. It was, I was imprisoned up until that point. So anyway, so I just want to sing, Worshiping the Majestic One is worth it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. It's worth it. No matter what people say, no matter what people mock, no matter what they say about the body of Christ, it does not matter. Even the mockers, we do it for the mockers so they won't become mockers, so they won't be mockers anymore. I was a God mocker. I know what it's all about. 
somebody was worshiping and thank God I, I, I come I become one of those fellow worshipers in Jesus name so I don't know if you learned anything today or about this after Christmas story something changed something changed and something's changing in our lives and in our hearts right now let's worship the Lord just for one song for now and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release you. If you're watching on Facebook, um, I just pray the Lord will bless you um, beyond anything you've ever experienced before in your life in 2021. I pray you don't give up. Some of you, I feel like you're hanging on just by, the, just by a thread. Don't give up. Press into the things of God. Say, nobody's going to rob me of my inheritance of being a child of God in Jesus' name. So just press in, press in, begin to repent. There's a thing where we must repent. Turn to Jesus. Repentance is what's needed in your life right now. Turn to God, turn to Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and things begin to change. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all to you right now in Jesus' name. And thank you, Lord, and I thank you, thank you, Jesus, for touching the hearts of many people that are watching this online on another day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.